السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا بني إنها إن تك مثقال حبة من خردل فتكن في السماوات أو في الأرض يأتي بها الله إن الله لطيف خبير يا بني أقم الصلاة وأمر بالمعروف وانهى عن المنكر وانهى عن المنكر واصبر على ما أصابك إن ذلك من عزم الأمور عطروا مجالسكم الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد No religion has bestowed so much honor, grace and dignity upon parents as the faith of Islam. The unique statures of parents has been readdressed frequently many times in several passages in the Quran. And ishkur li waliwalidayka ilayya al-masir. Show your gratefulness to me and to your parents. And this means that Gratefulness to God is intertwined, inseparable from gratitude to parents. If we lose one, we're going to lose the second. If you are not grateful to your parents, you are not going to be grateful to your Lord. And another verse, وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّاهِ Again, your Lord has infinitely decreed forever. This law is not changing. Has infinitely decreed that you worship none but Him and be kind to your parents. Again, kindness to parents is inseparable from worshiping God. And imagine here after monotheism, they believe in God. He mentions the very first step, the basics of our tenets, which is monotheism, Tawheed. This is how we differentiate Islam from other faiths. The first thing is Tawheed. 
And after Tawheed comes respect to your parents. It's a priority. It's not something which comes at the end. In faith, in matters of faith and religion, it's a priority. It comes in the beginning. وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّهِ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Because their existence, the existence of our parents in our life brings much grace and a blessing from Allah on us. One of the companions of the Prophet who lost his mother, he had a father and a mother. His mother died. So he was crying for several months. People came to him. They said to him, stop crying. Your mother was okay. She was religious. She went to a much better place in paradise. He says, I know I am not crying for her. I am crying for myself. I had God had opened for me two white gates which leads into paradise. The existence of my father and my mother. Now one of them has been shot. So I cry for myself. Not for my mother. I know she is in a much better place. A person who comes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam He tells the Prophet Ya Rasulullah I have committed a very grave sin So please show me the shortest and the fastest way To receive God's forgiveness The Prophet asks him Do you have parents? Are they still alive? He says yes my father is it still alive? The Prophet tells him to go and serve his father for the rest of his life. Go and be with your father and help him. This is the shortest and the fastest way to receive God's mercy and God's forgiveness. He didn't tell him go to Mecca and pay this much charity to the poor. Go and help your father and be with him. And when he turned and he was leaving the Prophet turned to the companions telling them that had he been having a mother, God would have accepted his repentance even much faster. You have to realize they are the biggest grace of our life. Take advantage, good advantage of their existence. Go and help them and be with them. One of the philosophers of Islam by the name of Abu Zayd al-Bastami he said, I reached today one of the highest levels of faith and wisdom and knowledge. But I did not get that through spiritual exercise, spending nights and days and meditating. I got all this grace in one night. I was with my mother in the room. My mother was old and sick. So in the middle of the night, my mother wakes up. And she feels that she's thirsty. And it was a bitterly cold night. It was a snowing outside. And she tells me, son, I am thirsty. I was reluctant in the beginning. It was so cold. And I was tired, sleepy. But then I remembered this is a mother asking me. And I am the only son for her. So I decided to jump. And I went into the snow and the cold and I went to a nearby stream brought her some water came back by the time I came back she was again asleep so I didn't know what to do I said to myself let me leave the cup of water next to her but then it was dark I felt that maybe she would never realize that the water is next to her so I had to stand waiting for her and I did, what, did not want to disturb her sleep. I wanted her to sleep in peace. So I was waiting and waiting and waiting one, two, three, four hours until dawn. By dawn she, has to, she had to wake up to do the prayers. So she saw me standing and holding the cup of water in my hand for several hours. By the break of the day, I felt empowered. 
I felt empowered with knowledge and wisdom in my heart, with a spiritual grace in my heart. I was a knowledgeable person by, by the sunrise of that day. And I knew that this was the result of serving my mother and being nice and kind and dutiful to her. Probably you've heard the story of the man who saw the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When he was circumambulating around the house of Allah in Mecca, he was carrying his mother on his shoulder and doing the tawaf. So he saw the Prophet. He said, Ya Rasulullah, have I fulfilled my duty towards my mother? I am listen, I am carrying her. The Prophet said, No. La wallah wala haqqa zafratin wahida. Not even, you have not fulfilled not even you have not returned to her the right of even one contraction zafra is the contraction of birth you know the pain that your mother endure during birth during labor one contraction you have not even fulfilled the right of one contraction don't think that if i if i stay with my mother for a few days and i take her here and there and bring her some medicine and listen to her I fulfilled my duty towards her. No, never. Never. وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّهِ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Then, إِمَّا يَبْلُغَنَّ عِنْدَكَ الْكِبَرَ أَحَدُهُمَا أَوْ كِلَاهُمَا فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفٍ وَلَا تنهرهما. Not only respect them when they are young, when your mother cooks for you, when your father takes you to vacations. No. But when they attain old age, يَبْلُغَنَّ عِنْدَكَ الْكِبَرِ Either one of them or both. فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفٍ وَلَا تَنْهَرْهُمَا Never ever be disrespectful to them. Repel them. Never ever do that. وَلَا تَنْهَرْهُمَا وَقُلْ لَهُمَا قَوْلًا Always address them. Sometimes our parents become old, both of them. So Allah wants me to be very patient with them. Address them in terms of honor. وَقُلْ لَهُمَا قَوْلًا كَرِيمًا And lower for them the wing of a humility. وَقُلْ رَبِّ ارْحَمْهُمَا Always pray for them, whether they are alive or dead. You have to. We have five daily prayers. At least take one, one of the prayers, at least one of them. Either the early, the dawn, noon, afternoon, Sunset night, take a time when you raise your hand in Qunut, recite this verse. Rabbi li wa warhamhuma kama rabbayani sagira. Oh my Lord, bestow your grace and your mercy on my parents. As they stood with me and they suffered and they sacrificed and they struggled with me during my childhood. Not only childhood, even today. Even when you are in your 30s and 40s and 50s, your mother is still the mother to you. It is still the same compassionate and merciful mother to you. Pray for them. Remember them in your prayers. But to brothers and sisters, is this honor and grace from Allah which has been bestowed on our parents, is it because our parents and our fathers have only the biological role in our life or it's for something else it's not only because they are our biological fathers it's because of their role in the family they are so important and so sanctified because their role in the family is so paramount and sanctified the role that they play in the family especially fathers here and tonight is the night which has been attributed to Ali in Al-Akbar. Traditionally, worldwide, the role of the parents is mentioned here during such a night. Their role is so important. Especially fathers, their roles have two folds. Number one, a father is, has to be a 
sustainer, provider, breadwinner. It is incumbent on them. It is mandatory on our fathers to sustain us financially, physically, to shelter us, to feed us. The hadith says, مَلْعُونٌ مَلْعُونٌ مَنْ ضَيَّعَ مَنْ يَعُولُ A father or a mother who are careless about their children. They don't care about them. They don't care about their welfare. They have been cursed and cursed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Can you take some time please and just move forward. Stand and just move few, few, few steps forward. Rahimallah man dhakar al-qa'ima min Ali Muhammad. صلوا على محمد وآل محمد I need another refreshing powerful صلوات from you صلوا على محمد وآل محمد so they have to spend. The father has to be taking care of his family. But, and of course, he should not leave his children without, without food, without care. One of the companions of the Prophet died. And he spent all his money, disseminated the money to the poor and the needy during his life. And he left nothing for his children. They came to the Prophet after his death. They said, Ya Rasulullah, such and such man, he died, he left nothing, he bequeathed nothing for his children, and now his children are hungry. The Prophet said, had you been telling me about him before, I wouldn't have let you bury him in an Islamic cemetery. How he leaves his children without food. He should have left some money for his children. This is a responsibility. But brothers and sisters, especially fathers here, and you're going to be fathers soon, inshallah ta'ala. We have to strike a balance here. This does not mean that the father or the mother have to overburden themselves all the time, overstrain themselves for the welfare and the safety of their children. Parents should, be, should not be overburdened by us, the children. And therefore they have to strike a balance. Neither, to, neither neglecting, completely neglecting their children and deserted them, deserting them, nor being overburdened by their needs. Because I know some parents, they go too far. They spoil their children. Spoil them. The son takes advantage of his father being nice and compassionate and, and religious and starts overburdening with him. He needs money. He needs a big birthday party for himself. His wedding has to be in this four season hotel or five season hotel. He needs a Lamborghini for instance. He needs to go to Honolulu for his vacations. He will take advantage of his father. And the father, this is very wrong of the father to be respondent always to his children's need. This is not good. You are spoiling them. You have to strike a balance. The hadith says, Do not have all your concern in life, only your wife and your children. فَإِنْ كَانُوا مِنْ أَوْلِيَاءِ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَخْذِلُ أَوْلِيَاءِهِ If they are religious, God will take care of them. Don't worry about them. And if they are irreligious, وَإِنْ لَمْ يَكُونُوا مِنْ أَوْلِيَاءِ اللَّهِ فَمَا شُغْلُكَ بِأَعْدَاءِ اللَّهِ Why? Why suffering? Why do you bother about them? Let them go. Because sometimes... Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّ مِنْ أَوْلَادِكُمْ 
عدو لكم فاحذروهم إن من أزواجكم يا أيها الذين آمنوا listen to this verse يا أيها الذين آمنوا all oh, who you believe there are some of your families spouses إن من أزواجكم وأولادكم and your children are enemies to you so be careful be aware فاحذروهم how do they become enemies to us when they start overburdening so they com compel the father to go and cheat steal in order to provide for his family plunder people's wealth to bring it to his own children so this was the first role sustainer provider the second which is the leading role and the primary role of the parents and fathers in particular not only to sustain us physically and financially but to, to sustain us spiritually parents are educators nurturers we learn from them brothers and sisters before we go to the school we learn from the mothers today some mothers they consider being a mother demeaning no i don't like to be called a mother call me engineer go, call me doctor being a mother is an honor for you because you are raising these children you are becoming the teacher the first teacher you the good people here all of you are the products of your mothers here because you were raised you are good because you have been raised by good mothers had your mother been not a good mother you wouldn't have been here tonight you would have been someone somewhere else so we have to respect our mothers because they are our teachers and therefore quran tells us always that our faith as parents is intertwined with the faith of our children protect not only yourselves but your family members your children the hellfire وأمر أهلك بالصلاة واصطبر عليها وكان يأمر أهله بالصلاة الله says the good prophets they did not to pray by themselves when they prayed they prayed together with their children with their family members in America there is a beautiful saying the family that prays together stays together stays together because they pray together the father the mother and the children together We have to be together. Togetherness is important in the family. When this ayah came, a person came to Rasulullah and said, I can barely protect myself against sin, and now God wants me to protect my wife and my children? This is too much for me, Ya Rasulullah. Too much. This is a big burden on me. The Prophet said to him, Isma, listen. حسبك أن تأمرهم ما تأمر به نفسك وأن تنهاهم ما تنها به نفسك. It suffices for you that you enjoin on them what you enjoin on yourself and forbid them what you forbid yourself. Meaning that you have to be a role model, an example, an honest example for your family, for your children. The father who does not pray cannot expect his son to stand for the midnight prayers. The mother who does not observe hijab and veil and chastity, the sample of chastity, cannot expect her daughter to be chaste. We have to be role model for them, brothers and sisters. They learn from us. Yes, they do look at us. When we lie at home, they learn from us. They start lying tomorrow. We have to be careful. How do we behave? And we have to practice what we preach. I know some parents, they want their children to be angels. Pure. What about the father? Is he nice? Is he pure? We can't have such expectations while we are hypocrites sometimes 
We have to practice what we preach in front of our family members and children. This is the worst thing to do. Is to enjoin the good, but you don't practice it yourself. To ask your son, your daughter, your husband, your wife, your friend to do good. But you yourself, you don't do it. You don't do it. And to forbid evil, but you are the first one to commit evil. Allah's curse will follow you if you do such a thing. I mentioned to my friends the other day that most of you are familiar with the book of Mafatih al-Jinan. Yes? Most of you are familiar. This is the most famous book of supplication within the Shia school of thought. Mafatih al-Jinan. I think in each and every house, rather in each and every room, you can find a copy of that book. In every holy shrine, in Iran, in Iraq, in everywhere. This book has a story. You know how many books of supplication we have today? More than a hundred. But this one, Mafatih al-Jinan is number one. Why number one, Mafatih al-Jinan? You know the story behind that? The author, Sheikh Abbas al-Qummi, when he compiled the book, he took it to a print shop. And he asked the man to print the book for him. Then he went back to him immediately and he said, please, I want my book back. Give it to me. There are certain things that I missed in my book. Give it to me. He went, he took it from him. He came back. And then one year later, later he went to the man and he gave him the book. The man said to him, what's wrong with you? You told me I need just to add a few things and it took you one, one whole year? He said, yes, it took me one whole year. Because when I brought you the book at the first time, I realized that I have written in that book the a'mal, the good deeds of the whole year, beginning from the first of Muharram, the month of Muharram, Safar, Rabi', Rabi' al-Thani, Jumaat, Jumaat, until, until the Al-Qa'da and the Al-Hijjah. For every night, there is prescribed prayers and dua. And I'm going to give this to the people. And since I myself did not practice what I have written there, no one would listen to it. And that book would lose its value. So I realized that I have to be the first one to practice that book. So I took one whole year. I was practicing the prayers and the supplications and the duas. And now, after I concluded the one year, take the book and print it. This is how the book became the, the very famous book. Because he practiced. If I stand in front of you today for hours and hours and hours and admonish you and advise you, and I don't practice, no one would listen to me. No one would listen to me. You're going to raise children tomorrow. Remember. Remember you have to practice in front of them. You have to be honest, number one, with Allah. And number two, with your family. So fathers, they have, fathers and mothers, both. They have a huge responsibility, huge, to practice what they preach. And then, fathers and mothers, I want to share something important with you. We have only a few nights left, maybe two more nights. And we're going to have a Q&A session, inshallah, on Monday. February 21st on in Ahlul Bayt Foundation inshallah for brothers and sisters on Monday because we're going to conclude this session on Sunday night inshallah so Monday night at 7.30 we're going to have a Q&A and I have received many questions from brothers and sisters we need to address them inshallah however I need to share something important with you parents and this is the a very sensitive issue today that we all are facing and this is the marriage of your sons and daughters I am only a messenger here to tell you to convey to you the cry that I have been hearing and the frustration that I have been seeing among your sons and daughters they reached an age 
which I believe they are well qualified to get married. Age of 20, 21, 22. I think some of them, I cannot say all of them, but they are qualified to get married. So you brothers and sisters, fathers and mothers, you are responsible, accountable before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment because this is your duty. The duty of parents is to find him a good name, to get him married and to educate him. And it's your duty to facilitate and simplify marriage for your children. Do not make it a complicated issue. Remove all the complications. Make it easy for them. Simplify marriage. Marriage at the time of the Prophet was so simple and so easy. We the Muslims, we made it a nightmare. We made it a dream for some. They reached the age of 30 and 35 and they cannot afford marriage. It's because of us, not because of Islam. When we overburden both sides, it's a necessity. Remember, today your children are being raised in an environment which is surrounded and filled with intimidation when they go to school, when they go to university. I remember at my time, at my time when I was a teenager, I could hardly watch TV. We didn't have TV at home. And now today, in each and every bedroom, there is TV, there is computer, and the kids are watching all sorts of movies and pornographies. This is intimidating for them, brothers and sisters. Listen. This is dangerous to them. They are surrounded by evil. You can't, at home, you can separate boys from girls. Here we can put some chairs in the middle. Can you do that at university? Can you do that when they travel together, separate them from each other? You can't. Again, I remember when I was young, I could hardly see a young lady around me. The only young lady who was around me was my grandmother, you know. But today, your children are always with them. Your daughter is with boys and your son is with girls. We have to fear Allah here. Let's not make it a burden. Let's make it easy for them. Sometimes we can help them financially, spiritually, emotionally, socially. We have to provide this help. We have to facilitate marriage for them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you have fear of poverty, you are distrusting me. In yakunu fuqara yughnihim Allahu min fadlih. Don't tell me my son has to finish his school. Maybe he would never finish his school. Who knows? After BA, he wants to do his master's, and after master's, he wants to do PhD and postdoctorate, and you know. Maybe he or she would never. Let's make it easy. A lady asked me the other day, can female Muslim, a Muslim girl, can she propose to a Muslim boy? Absolutely. Absolutely, yes. Yes. But don't do it now, huh? Wait. Yeah. <laughs> Wait until I, after I leave England. Yes, it happened during the time of the Prophet. One day the Prophet was giving a sermon in his masjid. A lady stood among the community, not in a private. She said, Ya Rasulallah, zawwijni. I want to get married, Ya Rasulallah. Because I want to protect myself. I want to protect myself. Man tazawwaja faqad ahraza nisfa deenah. Fal yattiqillaha fal nisf al akhar. Maybe some parents do not realize some fathers entertaining themselves with more than a wife, but when it comes to his son and his daughter, he's neglectful. He doesn't care. I see some people are smiling here. So we have to take this issue seriously, brothers and sisters, because I am delivering a, delivering a message to your parents, and if you laugh, they think that we are kidding here. We are not serious. So don't laugh and don't smile until I finish. Therefore, the Prophet said, Mallaha, who volunteers for her? A man stood from that side, or maybe this side, I don't know. 
And then he said, I am. Ya Rasulullah. The Prophet said, do you have something to offer her? A dowry, a marriage gift? He said, nothing. Alhamdulillah. My pockets are empty. No credit card, no money. He said, okay, what can you offer her as a gift? Do you know the Quran? He said, yes. I memorized Surah Al-Fatiha. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. This is the only thing I know. The Prophet said to her, is it okay for you to receive this gift from him, to learn Surah Al-Fatiha and marry him? She said, yes, Ya Rasulullah, whatever. I am ready. So, and the marriage took a place, brothers and sisters, was so simple. Help your son. Do not disappoint him. When he comes to you and wants to share this with you, to share the suffering, because if your son is unsafe, the whole family will be unsafe, morally. If the daughter is disturbed, the whole family will suffer, morally. So when he comes to you and he wants to share this with you and asks you to get married, do not shut his mouth, do not silence him. Tell him, yes, we're going to discuss this. Help him with that, help him. If we help, Allah will help. Believe me, brothers and sisters, this is a personal experience. If you take marriage difficult, Allah will make it difficult for you. If you take it easy, Allah will facilitate it for you. And the same thing for your daughter. Today, I asked some of my friends here, why you are not married? You are 25, 27. He said, Sayyid, for one reason, I can't afford dowry and mahar. I go proposing to her and the father asks for $2 million. I have to sell myself, you know, not my house, myself. Dower is not a trade, is not business. You are not selling your daughter. It's symbolic, symbolic gesture of love and respect. Mahru sunnah, beautiful. The mahar that Imam Ali provided for Fatima al Zahra. Symbolic, an equivalent of 500 pounds today here. 500 dir dirham at that time, Mahru Sunnah, is, has the purchasing power of 500 pounds. The most successful marriage in the history of mankind, the marriage of Ali and Fatima, was based on 500 pounds. Let's learn from Ahlul Bayt. We are not here just to spend several hours and leave home. We came here to learn and imitate and emulate and follow Ahlul Bayt. This is the essence of Islam. Let's make marriage easy for our children. And then let me conclude with this important topic, which is generation gap. Generation gap. How do we bridge this generation gap? Also, we are suffering because of this phenomena of generation gap. This is a universal phenomena. But I can find it very severe in the Islamic community in North America and Europe. The gap and the chasm which separates the young generation from the old generation because of different schools of thought, because of the difference of culture, cultural and social life, the inability to understand each other. They either do not communicate or sometimes they miscommunicate. The father comes home tired at the end of the day he doesn't have time to speak with his kids. He's exhausted. He's tired. He wants to eat something and go to bed. And he thinks that God sent him to America or Britain just to make money. I have seen some people who came to the West. And one thing they had in mind, making money. They did. They did make money. They were successful. But they lost their family and their children. Yes, they lost their sons and daughters because they don't have, they don't make time to communicate, to understand. One of the kids in our community who did not see his father, his father leaves early in the morning, comes back home late, and the son does not get time to see his father. He was yearning to see his father and talk to him and enjoy his company. One day his father came the kid did not want to go to bed. He said to his mom, I'm staying until my father comes back. So the father comes back. 
and the child opens the door and he tells him, Dad, how much dollars you make an hour? He said, $25 an hour. He said, Dad, this is my saving. This is $25. I want you to sit with me for one hour. I need to talk to you. I need to see you. I need to see you. This is $25. This is painful. Painful. We are losing our children. We have to fear Allah. It's not just you make children like a machine. Reproduces things and just leave them in the wilderness. You are responsible. You are accountable about their safety. Spend some time. Some parents treat the house as bed and breakfast. You know, I go home and my bed is ready and my food is ready and the following day I leave. I know women, alhamdulillah, they enjoy this, you know, when they hear it. But also some mothers also do not. Some, very little, few of them, also do not respect family values. They want to leave her, she wants to leave her kids, very young kids at the age of one and two and three, who need their mothers most, and she goes and works outside. You know, I know some mothers who takes her baby, her son, to the babysitting. And she spends $1,000 a month and she goes and works outside and she receives twelve hundred dollars but again for her to commute and go and come and you know change the dress and buy the makeup and have a nice haircut hairstyle she has to put a fortune so at the end of the day she's working but she's losing money here not only losing money money is nothing brothers and sisters losing the souls and the spirits of our children be with him. Be with your son. Be with him. Raise your son. Don't go and work for someone who does not deserve and leave your son unattended. You're going to regret that. This is the reason that kids at the age of 17 and 18 in the West, they leave the family. Why? Because the family, the mothers and the fathers did not provide them with, with compassion, with love when they were young. So why should he stay with his parents? We are Muslims. And again Allah says, وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّاهُ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا So we have this generation gap. They do not communicate. Again, one of the problems that we have is that these two generations, the old and the new, the old insist on sticking to their traditions, old traditions. And when you come to the new generation, they are attracted and fascinated and obsessed by the Western lifestyle, by modernity here. Fascinated with the Western music and dress and food and lifestyle and hairstyle. And even they start changing their names. Some, some of them, they really suffer identity crisis they don't know who they are at home with the family with the parents with the friends they assume an ethnic personality at home he's a muslim his name is abudi and saudi but outside the house he becomes dave and charles he wants to assimilate with a mainstream environment he assumes the mainstream personality. Her name is Sukaina and Ruqayya. She becomes what outside the house? Jennifer, Stephanie. Why changing names? One day a man came to me, a young man came to the mosque in America. Hi, I am Bob. <laughs> I said, you are not Bob. No, I know Bob, you are not Bob. <laughs> Tell me your real name. What is your real name? Oh, Sayyid, I am sorry. I am Qulam Abbas. He turned to be Ghulam Abbas. What's wrong with Ghulam Abbas, with Ali, with Muhammad, with Ja'far, with Abbas, even with Umar? What's wrong with it? Let's... I take it back. The last thing I said, I take it back. So. <laughs> Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad.
However, so let's let's be proud of our values, brothers and sisters. Proud of our values. When you come here, know you are a Muslim. Again, another example nowadays, which is really dominating our life in the West, is to see them so fascinated with the Western lifestyle, Western lifestyle. The other day, a lady came with hijab, and this is a new trend, a new fashion in America. She comes with veil, hijab to the masjid, but there is a ring in her nose here, you know. Another one, another one on her eyebrow here. The third one on her lips. And when she opened her mouth to speak with me, I saw another three on her tongues. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. Is this Islam? You are wearing hijab. Is this modernity and civility? We came to the West to learn the good things here, not the bad things. We have to fight the bad things. We should not dissolve in these deviations. Be yourself. Be proud of yourself, your religion. With the hairstyle, you cannot change yourself. Don't think that changing the hairstyle and wearing these baggy pants, which half, half of the trouser is being dragged behind him, you know, when he walks. People would not enjoy you. People would not respect you. I have told some boys many, many, many times, those who have, are fascinated with certain, I don't want to mention it, certain hairstyle, that if you think you are attracting women's attention, you are wrong. The best way to attract women's attention is when you have good personality and good character. They start liking you. Not when your hair is rising, you know. <laughs> this night belongs to Ali Al-Akbar, brothers and sisters. I had to share these things with you. I might not be able to see you. But we have a responsibility to un honor our Quran, honor the family of the Prophet, honor those martyrs. They gave their soul for you and me to survive here, to stay together, to be with the Quran, to protect our values. Ali al-Akbar was a young man like you at the age of 25 or 27. But he gave his life to defend Islam. For me and you to live safe here. Let's remember. And let's make a pledge tonight. Maybe two or more two or three more nights and we leave. Maybe some of you would not come until next year. Let's make a pledge with Ahlul Bayt that we want to follow you. We want to learn from you. We want to practice what we have learned. Let's practice that. Let's transfer, transform ourselves and learn from Ali Al-Akbar. After all the companions gave their life for the sake of Islam. On the day of Ashura, there were almost 70 or 75 people with Imam Hussein. First, the companions, the Ashab, they went first. They gave their life. And then, after all the Ashab, all the companions were finished, no one survived. Then came the turn of Ahlul Bayt, the household, the immediate family of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. They were ready to go and give the ultimate sacrifice. So who is the first one to come forward? Ali al-Akbar. And he is the eldest son of Imam Hussein. Imam Hussein is the leader, so he has to give his son first. Imam Hussein had three children. Ali, the senior, Ali, the junior, or Abdullah, he has two names, Ali al-Azgar or Abdullah, and then the third one, Zainul Abidin. Zainul Abidin was so sick, and Allah wanted to save him for the leadership, for the imama, to be the imam after his father. So he was in the tent, he could not move. 
Aliul Akbar comes, brothers and sisters. Now I want you to turn your hearts to Karbala. You know, Ali Al Akbar has been buried next to his father. If you go on, it, inshallah, to Karbala and pay tribute to Imam Hussein, after you finish the visitation of Imam Hussein, you turn to Ali Al Akbar. So Ali Al Akbar comes, and Ali Al Akbar had a strong resemblance to his grandfather, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In all departments, in shape, in speech, in manners too, in his tone of speech, he resembled his grandfather. Whenever Imam Hussein longed to see his grandfather, he will come and look at Ali and Al-Akbar. Not only Imam Hussein, the people of Medina, when they longed to see their apostle, their prophet, they will go and see Ali al-Akbar. Look at him. Reminds them of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So on that day, Ali al-Akbar comes, stands before his father. Father, give me permission. I want to be the first one to give my life. It was hard. But Imam Hussein would never say no. To most of the people who came to him, first thing he said no. But to his son, he would never say no. He welcomed him. But since he is a father, Imam Hussein is a father and he has emotions, deep emotions for his son. He looked at him for the last time and he knew that he is not going to see him again. ثم رفع شيبته المقدسة إلى السماء. إمام حسين raised his raised his head to the heaven, saying, اللهم اشهد عليهم. Oh my Lord, oh my Lord, be the witness over those people, this group of people today who surrounded us from all directions. Be the witness over them. فقد برز إليهم غلام أشبه الناس خلقا وخلقا ومنطقا برسولك. has emerged to them a boy, a young man, who bears much resemblance to your apostle, physically in his shape, in his speech of tone, in his manners. Whenever we longed and craved to see your apostle, we will come and look at his face. Allahumma na'hum barakat al وفرقهم تفريقا ومزقهم تمزيقا ثم قرأ هذه الآية إن الله اصطفى آدم ونوحا وآل إبراهيم وآل عمران على العالمين ذرية بعضها من بعض والله سميع عليم الله had chosen selected certain people آدم إبراهيم the family of Imran and made them the leaders and this is how Allah chose the Prophet Muhammad and us to be the guide for mankind at that time all the women in the camp they came they surrounded Ali in Al-Akbar <laughs> والأخرى تقول ارحم غربتنا ارحم غربتنا والثالثة تقول وضيعتنا بعدك women surrounded him from all direction one says to him Ali we cannot bear your departure Ali it's so hard for us what do we do after you Ali you are the light of this camp here if you go our light will be extinguished we will be left without light, without nur. But he was insistent to go and fight and defend, and defend Islam. He went. He bade farewell to women, to children. All the children surrounded him. He embraced his father, Imam Hussein. They were embracing for a while. And they were weeping until Imam gave him the final permission. He went to the battlefield. Ana Ali ibn al-Hussein ibn Ali. 
ونحن ورب البيت أولى بالنبي. He introduced himself to the masses. If you do not recognize me, I am Ali, the son of Imam Hussein, the son of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. By Allah, we are the closest people to Prophet Muhammad. Allah has sent us to be your guide and look at what you are doing with us today. نحن ورب البيت أولى بالنبي أضربكم بالسيف أحمي عن أبي ضرب غلام هاشمي قرشي. By Allah, I will continue my fight and my struggle against you until I achieve success and martyrdom. I would never leave my father alone. I have to support my faith and my religion tonight. His mother Ramla, her name was Ramla. His mother Layla was standing in the tent, not outside the tent. She was very nervous. She was standing in the tent and watching the face of Imam Hussein. When Ali ibn al Akbar was fighting, he went to the fight. His mother was inside the tent, but Imam was outside. So she came close to the Imam to watch the face of the Imam because the face of the Imam was reflecting for her the scene in the battlefield. Suddenly, Ramla saw the face of Imam change. The face of Imam change. It became a grin. She came to him. Ya ibn Rasulillah, al usiba waladi bishay. Any danger surrounding my son? He said, No, 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 no. There is no danger now. But Layla, go inside the tent. Go back again. Wad'i li waladiki fa inni sami'tu jaddi Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. يقول دعاء الأم مستجاب بحق ولدها. Oh, Layla, I want you to go back inside the tent and pray for the safety of your son because I myself, I heard my grandfather, the Prophet says, when a mother, a distressed mother, a mother who's in pain, going through so much pain, she cries and she prays for her son or daughter, Allah will respond to her positively. So go and pray for him. دخلت ليلى إلى خيمتها نثرت شعرها رفعت خمارها نثرت شعرها رفعت يديها إلى السماء. ليلى came back into the tent. She uncovered her veil. She spreads her hair. She raises her hand to the prayers. إلهي بغربة أبي عبد الله. يا راد يوسف على يعقوب. Oh the Lord who took Yusuf back to his father after forty years of separation. Eventually يعقوب was able to see his son safe. يا كاشف ضر أيوب. Oh the Lord. Oh the Lord who brought ease to أيوب after a long affliction and a long suffering. أردد علي ولدي. Oh my Lord, I want my safe, my my son to come back to me safe and harmed. Soon after her du'a, immediately Ali and Al Akbar came back from the battlefield. قال عب أبتاه العطش قد قتلني. Oh my father, I want to continue fight, but I am so thirsty. I need just a sip of a drink. العطش قد قتلني وثقل الحديد قد أجهدني فهل لي إلى شربة من الماء أتقوى بها على الأعداء. His father said to him, O son, Ali the Akbar. First, I want you to go to his to your mother. She's dying inside the tent. Let her see you safe now. He went to his mother. He saw her sobbing and crying. He came to her, calming her and comforting her. He said to her mother, Mother, look at all those women who are around you. They all lost their husbands and their children. And they're going to come, Mother, on the day of judgment. They're going to stand before Fatima al-Zahra, my grandmother, proud. They're going to be proud. Oh, my mother, my beloved mother, you don't want to be proud before Fatima al-Zahra? She said, Bala, Bala, Bayyad Allah, Wajhak. 
Yes, my son, I want to be proud. Of course, I want you to go back. I want you to defend your father in Islam. I want to meet with your grandmother tomorrow with a shining face. But I have one last request from you, ya son Ali, my dear Ali. One, one last request because before you go back to the battlefield. بلا بلا بني تخطى أمامي خطوات حتى أتزود من النظر إليك. My last request from you is that you walk in front of my eyes so can I can see you for the last time. I can remember you, my son. اتقلا يا يا ابني يا وليدي هالساعة وتفارقني هالساعة وتفارقني اتقلي على فرقاك ايش يصبرني وحييت يا ضو عيوني وبيك الدهر فجعني يا ابني ما اقدر الفرقاك خذني للمعارة وياك حتى انشتل يا ابني هناك Oh mother, take me with you. I don't want to live after you. I can't. I can't live after you. I can't see the house empty without you, my son. Ah, ah. Ali ibn al-Akbar went back. Went back. He was fighting courageously until the brothers and sisters, the death toll mounted. One time, Amr ibn Munqid al-Abdi, لعنت الله عليه. He was standing. He strikes him. He dealt him a blow on his head. Ali ibn al-Akbar. He embraced the horse, and the horse took him to the camp of the enemies. They surrounded him. They encircled him from every direction. They started raining him with arrows and with their sword. Nada, nada, abtaah alayk min al-salam. This is the farewell salam, the farewell greeting. Each and every member of the camp, when he goes, his last word would be عليك من السلام أبا عبد الله هذا جدي قد سقاني بكأسه الأوفى شربة لا أضرأ بعدها أبدا As you promised me, now I met with my grandfather رسول الله He gave me the cup of a drink that I would never get thirsty after it and you know, Father, I have a news for you. You have another cup waiting for you. Al-Ajal, Al-Ajal, I want you to join us, Father. Come to this happiness. Come and see your father, Ali. Your mother, Fatima. Your grandfather, Rasulullah, are waiting for you. Your brother, Hassan, are waiting for you here. The angels are waiting for you. Ah, 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 ah. Imam Hussein, he rushed to him. He rushed to him, brothers and sisters. He stood, th he stood there and he was shouting, Wa walada wa aliya. Rahim Allah man nada wa aliya. Wa akbara. Ah, ah. Imam Hussein bends down and puts his cheek on the cheek of Ali and Al Akbar. But he could not lift him. He could not. Anyone who falls down, Imam Hussein will be the first one to go and lift him and bring him to the mortuary. Except Ali and Al Akbar. His father, Imam Hussein, was powerless. He could not lift him. He said, Ya Fityan Bani Hashim, Ihmilu Akhakum Ali. Oh, the family of Bani Hashim, come and help. Come and carry the body of Ali. أريد أمسح جروحك وشم خدك وحط صدري على صدرك ووزدك يا وحط صدري على يا 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 صدرك ووزدك قعد عنده وشاف مغمض العين متواصل طبر والراس نصين بدم سابح مترابين الخدين حين ظهر على وليد وتحسر اصفي عيني سقط منها وبعد ما اشوف تفايض دم دمعها ولا يفيد الروف 
أخبرك بالدهر عمل العمل وياي أخذ شعرة قلب وقطع بها حشاي ايه اخذ شعرة قلب وقطع بارك الله بها حشاي زينب عليه السلام شي كيم اوت اوف ذا تنت وهي تنادي ان شي كرايز وعلي وولده وابن اخاه You know what Imam Hussein did to her? Imam Hussein, he went to her. He holds her hand. He says to her, Ya Zainab, I don't want you to go out among the enemies. I want you to stand. Your honor, your respect is more important to me. Listen, sister. Listen, Muslim sister. Your honor and your respect is more important to me than my son, Ali Al-Akbar. يا ابن علي يا فتشة العين يا ابن صواب الصايب كوين أنا منين جتني كربلا منين 